Good evening. This is Deborah B. Wilson, and I am in Bradford. The day, the date is 18th of January, 2021. The day is Monday, and the time is 1600 hours and 56 minutes, and that's GMT. I'm going to go. I'm going to speak slower than normal because I find when I speak in my normal speed I make lots and lots of mistakes and occasionally I I stay near a busy street and occasionally um, it's quite noisy so you might hear a noise in the background my neighbors noise so please bear that in mind. So the name of the podcast is Privilege Privilege as space, and how Diane Abbott, MP in the United Kingdom, and SO15, the counterterrorism policing entity out of London, the Metropolitan Police, which is in the UK, how both these, one's a person, Diane Abbott, how interactions, quote unquote, with both these, Diane Abbott, uh, metaphorically speaking, and SL15, literally, I had interactions with them, how they gave me the privilege of space. I am a descendant of slaves. I was born in America. I am 63 years old, so I'm trying to give you context from give you some sense of how I might experience the world. I said might. I'm from Chicago, which is a highly segregated city. And one of the things being marginalized has meant for me is always having a reason for being someplace in case you're stopped by the police or questioned by a white person in a store, what are you doing here? Always having a reason, an explanation, explaining yourself. I started traveling to the UK when I was in my late 20s in the 1980s, London. And I came to the point that I traveled three to four times a year. Well, I'm absolutely enamored with politics, culture, the intersection of, well, po political systems of merge out of cultural narratives, right? And sociology, right? And how all those things intersect and come to be. So my first trip to London was a really touristy trip and probably one of the few touristy trips I took to London. And we went past Westminster. And I remember asking one of the, the tour guide mentioned on this British Airways tour that uh, you stop by and visit Westminster. So I'm asking this while well, I was young, I'm looking back as a 63 year old. Um, and I remember asking this man who, like myself, was young, can I just go there? Can I just go there? Because again, we have to have a reason. We need permission, right? And so he's, of course, he said, I remember him saying something like, love, yeah, just go. So I started going to Westminster. I remember the first time I went with great fear and trepidation that I was going to get stopped and questioned. And so uh, this is over 30 years ago. And I remember all I had to do was go through the security check like everybody else. And I, just, I would just walk around. First floor, ground floor, just walked around. And then at one point it hit me that I was in, uh, uh, sitting, walking in this place, walking around, unfettered, right? Just walking around. And I remember finding a space to sit and I just started crying because I could not believe this. I'm just walking around. And I recognize some of the politicians because I always followed British politics. 
there was no social media then, so I purchased newspapers. I spent most of my time when I traveled to London from day one of watching the news and keeping track of the political machinations in this country. And then uh, when I was in, uh, when I lived in Chicago, I always found a place to buy the uh, sh uh, Chicago, the, 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 the Times newspaper, the Sunday edition. Um, and I tried to get a hold always the FT Financial Times, their weekend edition. In time, I ended up uh, 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 subscribing to the publication seven days a week, but I, not six days. It'll be the weekend edition, Monday through Friday, the weekend edition. Oh my God. And I would just devour anything about politics. So I'm sitting in this space, and there's these politicians walking by, and some of them I recognize. So every year I travel to the UK at least once, and then twice, and then it got up to three to four times a year. But I remember by the time. I remember feeling nervous and that this time they were going to stop me and ask me, what are you doing? Why are you coming back here? I remember always thinking that in the back of my head, even though if you saw me, you looked at me and you wouldn't think anything. I'm going there. And I was dressed uh, in business attire because I felt like I had to be my best and, and had to be quite formal. Well, anyway, as I said, I followed all these things political. And then I remember Diane Abbott, who was a black MP, and I told someone who was brilliant. Uh-oh, I have to cry. She started this group called Black Women Mean Business for Black Women Entrepreneurs, Business Women. And so I wrote to her office and said that I would like to be a member, although I didn't live in the country. I wasn't a British citizen. I was in Chicago. Could I please be put on a, a list of, and she said, well, I can do better than that. The person, not Diane Abbott, but it was one of her uh, staff, said, we'll send you out some information, and they mailed it to my post office box in Chicago. And so um, I never made it to one of the Black Women Mean Business meeting, and I never met the MP. Hmm. hope I can get through this without crying. But knowing that I was on this list that was inspired by Diane Abbott gave me the right and the reason for going in and out of Parliament. And it increased my confidence because if I was stopped and asked, what are you doing, which I never was, but I had a reason. I had a right. I had uh, that had given me the right. I felt like I now had the right. So I ended up attending all sorts of meetings in Parliament that are open to the public. Anybody can go. But that confidence to reach out, to belong, to feel like this was where I belonged, came from Diane Abbott's Black Women. Black Women Mean Business. So I really believed I belonged and belonged and had a right. And so as time went on, I, I did uh, many volunteer jobs in London whenever I was in the country, and sometimes I did extended stays in London, and I would find a volunteer job because I, I, the best way for me to understand and to fit in is to work and to contribute. So there were feminist-based organizations of all kinds, and I got volunteer jobs with them and did work. Nothing particularly exciting. But I went to an office or a space, and most of the times I did things like filing, answering the phone, assisting the women or women that were actually running the NGOs, and they were very small NGOs. The largest place I think I ever worked for was the Feminist Library. Over time, uh, I continued keeping my foot in this organization and that organization, and that's the other thing. I joined organizations. So I was now a part of civil society and doing this activism. After the invasion of Iraq uh, and the relational increase of extremism related to some, from some 
who many people disagreed with the invasion of Iraq. Some of the for some of those people, a minority of those people, that disagreement was weaponized and their behavior was extreme and resulted in terrorism. So I wondered how the state understood what was happening, right? And then I wondered how the state understood how some women's civil society responded to what was happening. So I started flying into the country, still doing the three to four times uh, uh, a year. And I went from meeting to meeting, interviewing civil society people who also had an interest in what the state was doing and um, their critical analysis and understanding of how the state was reading what was happening and responding. Then it, I mentioned it before uh, online, and uh, at one point I came into the country, uh, and uh, an immigration officer uh, was actually an SO15 officer there uh, at the, uh, there at the airport. I mean, that's no secret. You can see that online. They talk about that online. The counter uh, terrorism police, you know, SO15, because I flew, I always flew into overwhelmingly into Heathrow Airport. Asked me what was I doing for him meeting to meeting, taking notes. Well, uh, that's what I was doing, <laughs> going from meeting to meeting. So it was really scary and confusing. Um, um, uh, I, I didn't know what to make of it. So we ended up having this conversation, if you can call it that, um, that he asked if I was, I told him what I was doing, which was I was trying to understand if the uh, national security model uh, for the United Kingdom truly reflected the threat and the need of the people. Were they overreaching, underreaching? Were they doing damage while they were trying to assist? So this is me, right? Um, I'm an accountant and a human resource person. That's what my career was in America. And so I'm talking to him and saying, and my voice is, is trembling. And so he said, um, would you be amenable to sharing your findings with us? And I said, some, he said something like that. And I said something like, I, I don't know what you mean. I'm sorry, I don't know what you're talking about, my findings. And he elaborated some more. And then he said, Madam needs to learn to speak up and make herself heard. Well, um, it, it was uh, over a few years I shared my research with SL15. Um, I don't, uh, I don't know if I could fairly say I got used to talking with them, but I certainly got more confident about my work. About and so to. To, to, to do critical analysis of the state from a distance. So we put together reports in these organizations and we submitted them to the country, uh, to the government home office's policy papers. And, and it was groups of women's research work that went in there, right? But to actually have the state talking to me and saying they want to hear the criticism was surreal. And I have to admit at the beginning, I thought I was being set up. I thought they were, <laughs> I thought I was being set up. Okay, now, honey, you've gone too far. That's it. You know, yeah. But that's not what happened at all. At one point, I had something that I was particularly critical of. And I was, and so I said what I was particularly critical of. And he repeated it back to me. Uh, and I said, okay. And he looked at me and he said, okay. Is that what you meant when you said that? Um, and I said, well, no, actually it wasn't. And so then I clarified it. And this counterterrorism policing officer, an older white man, said to me, don't say what you think we want to hear. Say what you think. If you disagree with us, say it. We want to hear it. I certainly did not need the approval of the state because I was already doing the work. Indeed, they reached out to me. Isn't that a nice sanitized way to put it? <laughs> they reached out to me. Uh, 
while I was in the midst of doing this work. But I, I would be disingenuous if I didn't say the experience of constantly interacting with SL-15 at Heathrow Airport and standing my ground and having discussions with them, questioning me about my work, made me more resolute and confident and a stronger researcher to, as a civilian with no access to the national security model, model other than what we see publicly, to seek to opine on that model and then actually have one of the practitioners standing in front of you, saying very little, but still that practitioner standing in front of you and on a regular basis asking you questions in those encounters. So when I say on a regular basis, when I came into the country and asking questions, I, I found a voice around a subject matter that I never thought I would ever be engaged with. And I found my voice. I found a place I belonged and I found my space. So this podcast is briefly looking at, again, privilege as space. So Diane Abbott, Black Women Mean Business, Diane Abbott, the MP, gave me space. And SL15, it's not, it's kind of scary to stand in front of them. I'm a foreigner. And I was critical of the, I had some things about the national security model in which I was critical of that, that I differed with the state. Not a citizen, didn't live in the country, but there was space for me from an analytical and respectful manner to give voice. SL15 gave me that space. This podcast was privileged as space. This is Deborah B. Wilson. I'm so proud of myself because I've had a couple of breaks there where I almost, well I did, I'm ready to cry, but I got through it. Thank you so much for listening.